Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome to the Geek Therapy Radio podcast. Got your mental curator, Johnny Hember. I have a story in the top of my head, a memory on the top of my head from high school, and I just want to share it with you guys uh, before I forget it. And I don't know, it just it's one of those memories, I haven't thought about this for years, it just popped into my head, and it just makes me laugh. Anyone else have those moments, you haven't thought about a certain scenario or situation for years, then it pops up and you're like, oh yeah, I remember that, and it's a kind of a fun memory. So anyways, back in high school... I guess this would be around the year, would be around the year 2000. I got my driver's license. This is a car story. I got my driver's license in 1999. And it was one of the only times my dad uh, showed up at school and pulled me out of school so that we could go to the Department of Transportation here in Texas and get me my driver's license. He was like... To, you only get out of school to go to a doctor's office, doctor's appointment, dentist appointment, something like that. Nothing. And my dad was just kind of a weird, a weird nurturer, I will say. I'll just leave it at that. So he shows up and we it's Thursday and I go to I went to a private school. It was, at the time it was called Northeast Christian Academy. And it was Thursday, which meant chapel day, which meant basically I'll just say it. It was going to be Bible bashing for an hour just i mean all of it was bible bashing every day in and day out my only prayer going to school and after school was god please don't make me hate you because of how that school bible bashed all the students it was horrible anyways at least at the time it was horrible so thursday chapel my dad just shows up in the gym door and somebody's like our teacher comes over hey John, your your dad's here. And I'd look back and dad's standing there like looking so happy, like standing in the gym door, just kind of waving, just quietly. So I get out, I get out of my seat and walk past a bunch of other kids. Like, what's up, Pops? What's going on? He's like, let's go. It's like, what are you talking about? Let's go. It was my birthday, August 25th, 1999. I turned 16 years old. So he's like, we're going to get your driver's license. I'm like, what? You, why are you bringing me out of school? Like, I thought we'd wait till, I don't know, Saturday or something. No, let's go. Got my driver's license. That was a little sidetrack, that little part of the story. So anyways, I just got my driver's license. Maybe it was a year after that, maybe around 2000. Just kind of painting the picture of what time in my life this was. I had a friend, and I don't know if he listens to the show or at least listens to the show regularly. His name is Corbin. And I forget if we were juniors or seniors or sophomores, whatever. Corbin used to go through, at this time in his life at least, he used to go through cars like t-shirts. He would get one car, have it for a couple weeks, couple months it seemed, and then he would trade it for another car. Just just a lot of old, you know, used cash cars. Just kind of cheap cars you trade and trade and trade and trade. I don't know what the deal was, how much he actually spent on top of it, but he would just keep trading cars. He would just change cars like he changed t-shirts. So we had his dad's Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's like a 1994, 1992 Jeep Grand Cherokee. That was a good car. He traded that for something, traded this for something, traded that for something. So he had stuff like a Ford Probe, a Nissan 240SX, uh like a 70 something Camaro. I, I, uh, what did he have? A Nissan Maxima. Like he went through cars so fast. Okay. That's just his thing. He was really, really into cars at the time. Corbin, I'm sorry. I got to say this at the time he was kind of, uh, everyone has a friend who, who comes off as a know-it-all in Corbin, <laughs> Corbin at high school was that know-it-all friend. So, one week, he cruises over to see what, you know, to show off his car of the day, and he cruises over in the Nissan 240SX. I forget what year it was, 91, 92, Nissan 240SX, and he had had several cars up to this point, and we went cruising around, we went cruising around the baseball fields near my mom's house, or near my parents' house, kind of around Kingwood a little bit on Trailwood Drive, and I was like, Corbin keep this one 
this is a cool little car. It was, I mean, it was fairly quick. It wasn't a Ferrari or anything like that, but it was pretty quick. It's Nissan. It's going to be reliable. It looked pretty good. It was just, it was a sporty coupe. Like, it's like, Corbin, you found it. Like, your, your car search should end here for now. This is a good car. Keep this one for a few years and just enjoy it. And I forget what his response was. It was something like, yeah, maybe I will, or we'll see about that, whatever. So, a few days later, or a few weeks, maybe a couple months, I don't know, seemed like a few days later, he shows up with this, like, 1970-something uh, Camaro. And it's a Camaro, but it was geared for racing. It had big, huge, fat back tires. The inside of it was kind of stripped out. It wasn't a rust bucket or anything like that, but it was. it was a very stripped down kind of drag race old 1970s Camaro and he pulls up and it's really stupid loud it wasn't a car that was supposed to be just driven on the street so he comes over and we cruise around a little bit in his Camaro and you know I we had both been driving for the same amount of time at this point, where I, I should say we both had a driver's license for the same amount of time both had a driver's license for a year or two so we're cruising around, not speeding or anything like that. I don't remember. But uh, so we're cruising around and I say, Corbin, let me drive the Camaro. Scoot driver, pull over, you know, by the baseball fields and let me drive it around. And he had his arm out the window, you know, just cruising, laying back. He's like, nah, dude, you couldn't handle the torque steer. And he said it with 100 percent, like 100 percent conviction. He's like, no way, bro. You couldn't handle the torque steer. So quick side note about torque steer. Torque steer is when the engine has so much torque, it literally pulls the car to the left or to the right. And you have to fight it with the steering wheel to keep it straight. There's so much torque in the engine. So I didn't beg him or anything like that. I just said, all right, well, you know, whatever, whatever, dude. So we just kept cruising. A few days later, he wraps it around a tree. And I think he broke his leg or broke his arm. He was overall, he was fine. But I was like, see, dude, I didn't want to rub it in his face. I was like, torque steer, huh? I can't handle the torque steer, huh? Hmm. You should have kept that 240. You should have listened to me and kept that 240. And that's the end of that story. No, nah, bro, you couldn't handle the torque steer. <laughs> and then he wraps it around a tree. All right, anyways, so... In this podcast, I wanted to talk about Flight Simulator a little bit more. Meat and Potatoes is going to be Flight Simulator. I played it a little while longer last night. Getting through that learning curve. Uh, f- just fiddling more with the autopilot systems and the GPS. Last night I was flying around in the Cessna 172. And fiddling with the autopilot and the comms and everything in there. And it was great. Still a learning curve, but it was great. Got the autopilot figured out decently enough. So I set a little flight path, or a little, I uh, set a course, flight plan to take off from Hobby Airport here in Houston, South Houston, and fly to Sugarland, uh, region of S- Sugarland Municipal, I think is what it is. It's, it's an airport relatively near where I live in uh, Missouri City. Sugarland is close to Missouri City. So it's a short flight because what I wanted to do was take off and stay on course with autopilot towards Sugarland and then make my approach to Sugarland and engage autopilot for the final and, and land with the ILS uh, localizer. And I'm fiddling with the controls and I'm, I'm f- looking through the, the VFR maps and anything I could find within Flight Simulator itself in order to for ILS to work to do an automated... Uh, approach to do an automated landing you need to have that ILS frequency for the localizer and I can't find it anywhere usually it's like 110.30 109.20 it's it varies for it varies per runway so if you're at a at an airport that has, supports the localizer and it has multiple runways so let's say Bush Intercontinental Airport Chicago O'Hare Los Angeles LAX Logan Airport and Boston whatever all those big airports with half a dozen or more runways they all all every single runway has its own localizer frequency so I'm looking through my flight simulator looking on the map trying to find why 
and, and maybe it's there, maybe it's not. I couldn't find the localizer frequencies for Sugarland. Sugarland, Sugarland Airport definitely has a localizer on it. Of course, Bush Intercontinental has all all the runways have localizers. Most of the runways, anyways, have localized. Can't find it. You'd think that'd be readily readily available information in Flight Simulator 2020. And I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying I haven't found it yet. It is easily. Uh, easily findable in, in legacy Microsoft Flight Simulators. You just bring up the map and then you can zoom in on the airport and you see the local the green arrow for the localizer and you click inside of there and you can see what the ILS frequency is. Very easy. I can't f find that as of now. Again, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I can't find that as of now in Flight Simulator 2020. What I did find out though in my searching, and we're gonna talk about the downloading bugs in a minute or two or three or four or five, but what I did find out in my searches, Google searching, the issue of how do you find the ILS localizer frequencies in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. I found a video on YouTube, and I want to give, come on, play, I want to give the YouTube creator a, a shout out here, so let me go to my view history and see where he is here. I want to give him a shout. Basically, the video was how to set up an ILS uh, approach, ILS landing. The creator is called. Oh my gosh! I, it's one of. Why does? Why do names have to be so weird? Deceive, deceive. It's D E C I V Y E. D E C I V Y E. That's the name of his YouTube channel. And it, it, Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020: How to do an ILS approach. So what I gleaned from this video, and it's the only thing I've really looked at so far, is that since Flight Simulator 2020 is real world and it's updated, you know, every second technically by, with real world data, that to find the ILS frequency for whatever airport you are flying into, you literally go to Google, type in the call sign for that airport, and bring up the frequencies for the runways at that airport. So you'd go to Google and type in KLAX. I'm going to do it right now in real time. Google KL, KLAX. I'm going to do ILS for runway 25L, 25 left. And the frequency I'm pulling up here for, 20, for 24L is 111.70. And apparently, as of right now, I guess, in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, that's how you find the localizer frequencies. You open up a Google window and literally type in the airport you're trying to fly into, and that's how you do that. Type that frequency, 111.70 for KLAX, in this instance, runway 24L, 11.70 into your nav radio and set your autopilot for approach make sure it's in navigation mode put it into approach and it'll grab the localizer and it'll pull you in basically and then you are left in most cases you know with a Cessna 172 at least you are left to prepare for landing do your flaps maintain your airspeed uh, paint the pic well you don't have to paint the picture because that's exactly what ILS does for you do your mixtures, just prepare for landing, all your your landing checklist, do it. So I, I'm not going to say that that's how you do it in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, but that is one way how you do it right now. It is certainly not something that while you are flying is readily available with, with a couple of button strokes. And I, I might put my foot in my mouth here, I... I punched all over the keyboard yesterday trying to figure out what's going to bring up the information for the airport. I pressed escape, I went into options, and I was looking at different maps and things. It, it wasn't something that was easily accessible. But I might just chalk that up to learning curve gum, coming from legacy to Flight Simulator 2020. That it might just be in a different spot. Either way, it wasn't as intuitive as I would have liked it to be. That is not a knock on the software. That is not a knock on Flight Simulator 2020. It just means that there's a different way to do things if you're coming from Flight Simulator X 
the la the most recent release before Flight Simulator 2020 up to Flight Simulator 2020. It's just doing things in a different way. And right now, the easiest way to do it is to have Google open and search for the ILS frequency of the runway you want to make an approach onto and dial that into your navcom and, and there you go so for those of you on who, who don't who can't care less about flight simulator sorry now you're you're just hearing a bunch of terms and different things and hopefully you find that interesting a, a little bit i do want to talk about before actually before we get into downloading issues a lot of people have been and that's another statement a lot of people have been having an issue with the launcher and the downloader hanging or going extremely slowly. What I wanted to mention before we get into that is if you go on Steam at least and you look at the product reviews, is the game recommended? Uh, the critic scores the game recommended, is it not recommended? And for Steam, it says something like very positive reviews, positive reviews, mixed reviews. Negative reviews, overwhelmingly negative reviews. Those are that's the scale basically of whether the user base has recommended the game or not, what they think about the game. And right now, this is interesting because if you all the hype with Flight Simulator 2020 and, and all the the well respected and big gaming critics and everything, for the most part, are very very happy with Flight Simulator 2020. Some games have given a 10 out of 10, 9.9 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10. It's getting very high marks from game critics. So it's interesting that you go to Steam, and maybe this just says more about the reviewing gaming community, us in the peanut gallery, than it does about actual, you know, professional game critics, game reviewers. It says that it's mixed. Reviews are mixed for Flight Simulator 2020, when they're, all the rest of their internet in most every respected video game journalist is giving it a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. Why is the community giving it mixed reviews, mixed recommendations? It's because a lot of consumers downloading Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 are confusing the download experience for the gaming experience. Since they're having a hard time downloading the game, they are giving it a thumbs down when that thumbs down actually has nothing at all to do with the actual gameplay and function of the game as it works properly. After it's installed and you're flying around, those thumbs down have nothing to do with that. All the thumbs down, the mixed reviews, the mixed rating that you get on Steam is because people are having a hard time downloading the game. So... If you're relatively interested in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 and then you go on to Steam to see how what kind of reviews it's getting and was it recommended or not recommended, it's gonna you're gonna see mixed and you're thinking, well, that's not good. I guess the game really isn't that good. Those mixed reviews, the thumbs down, have nothing to do with the game itself. I just want you to know that. And it can be the same thing with other games as well. If someone has a bad time downloading the game or they can't get the game to run, they're going to give the game a thumbs down, not recommended. It's not exactly relevant to the gameplay itself. A download issue, hanging on download or inability to download or launch the game or install the game, that doesn't really reflect on gameplay. It, it's bad, but it doesn't reflect on gameplay. You get what I'm saying? So, what that's here's what that says to me. This is kind of a thought that that entered my mind. This is the general advice for the general listener out there who is not passionate about flight simulator but they've heard a ton about flight simulator they've heard so many good things about the flight simulator and it's revolutionizing the way games are made and it's the biggest game ever and has every square inch of the world mapped up and all the hype just miles and miles and miles of hype about the game and game critics and reviewers love the game it's it's the most revolutionary thing mankind has ever done with a video game you're hearing all that good stuff all that hype seeing all these good reviews you might be thinking, should I get the game? Well, everyone loves it, should I get it? So here's my take on that, here's my general advice. If you have no interest in simulators, if flight simulators never interested you, if you've never been interested in flight simulator before now, all the way from the early 80s until 2020, if you've had no interest in flight simulators, this one isn't going to change your mind 
And this one can be so overwhelming and so daunting that you might turn you might spend the money on it, turn it on and then wind up like this is this is so much. I I don't even know where to start with this. It's 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 a certain type of person who really gets the most out of Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's the person who gets the most out of it, the absolute most out of it is the simulation enthusiast and flying enthusiast, airplane enthusiast. If you are a geek about airplanes, if you are a geek about aviation or a geek about simulators, even any simulator, then you will get the most out of Microsoft Flight Simulator, and it is the best of the best that has ever existed to date in the history of mankind and flight simulation. It's the best. I know you can argue, oh, well, X-Plane this and RC, what's the other, RCSCS, R the fighter plane, really cool. Nothing is on the scale, nothing stacks up, nothing compares to Flight Simulator 2020. Microsoft put all of their might and resources into making this the best flight simulator of all time. They've already had the best flight simulators of all time, arguably. So, of course, this is going to be one of the best flight simulators of all time, if not the absolute best. But if you have a passing interest and you're curious because of all the hype, maybe I'll download. I've heard a lot of hype. I'll download Flight Simulator 2020. You're not going to have a good time. If you aren't cut out for it, if you don't have that if you're not a geek about aviation in any shape, way, shape, or form, I don't think 2020, Flight Simulator 2020 is going to change your mind. I think it would actually scare you further away with all of its, how daunting it is. Now, I know some of you are yelling at me in your mind about that opinion, but let me address something real quick. There are modes, yes, there are modes in Flight Simulator 2020 that are more arcadey so you don't need to get into the the whole you know checklist but pre-flight checklists you can be in the hangar doing pre-flight checklists and then ha actually get on the radio and ask the tower for pushback you can turn on your apus turn on your 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 turbines and, and go through the entire checklist of turning on engine one two three and four and requesting a truck to come and power up your ap like it's crazy absolutely insane the amount of detail that you can go through in this simulator absolutely insane but and i compare it kind of to gran turismo the gran turismo games the older ones usually had a disc for arcade mode hey you don't want to go through all the simulation you don't want to grind your way through upgrading cars and earning enough money to buy new cars and upgrade the parts and everything you don't want to spend hours and hours a day i used to spend 12 hours a day 18 hours a day in Gran Turismo 4, just grinding through Gran the simulation part of it. That's just what I like. That's my personality type. I love that. I use my blinker every single freaking time I change a lane because I feel like a pilot when I master control of my vehicle. That's just the type of person I am. Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 absolutely has more arcadey game modes. So if you have n if you've never played a flight simulator before, yes. You can get into Flight Simulator and then choose like learn to fly mode or uh, different modes where you, you kind of fly through rings and try to complete missions and things like that. Yes, there are modes for that. Is there enough? I, and I haven't played through all those modes. Is there enough there? If you are the arcadey type of flying game, if you like Ace Combat, basically, I love friggin Ace Combat. I adore Ace Combat. It's one of my favorite video game franchises of all time. If you love Ace Combat in fighter pilot games like that, you will get joy out of Flight Simulator 2020. I am not sure that there's enough there, though, to keep your interest. The Flight Sim community has been playing Legacy Flight Simulator since 1982. They are diehard. I, we've been playing, I've been playing Microsoft Flight Simulator X. I think that came out in 2006. I've, I've said many times on Geek Therapy Radio before, my favorite game is Street Fighter. Of all time, it's Street Fighter. And then it's going to be, the second most I've spent time on is Rocket League. But really, as far as time spent playing any game, when I say I probably spent the most time playing Street Fighter and then Rocket League and then whatever, that's because I'm not counting Flight Simulator. I have spent thousands and countless, uncountable thousands of hours 
inside a flight simulator, playing flight simulator since I was in elementary school. Since 1994 or 1995, flight simulator 1995, I have been, I have logged so many hours since I was a child in Microsoft Flight Simulator, but I never really counted it as a video game. But as far as screen time for any simulation or game all combined, it's been Flight Simulator. So of course, somebody like me and th that type of enthusiast community is going, it is just, we are in heaven right now with Flight Simulator 2020. To the, the, to the onlooker who's heard all the hype, can you enjoy tw Flight Simulator 2020 playing arcade type modes? Yes, you can. I am just not sure how long that will hold your interest. But should you get it? Mm. Oh, gosh, if you're if you're passingly interested, should you buy it? That's tough. That's tough because I can only speak for me. If I'm passive, passively interested in a game, I will put it on my Steam wish list, and then I, and then I will wait for it to go on sale. If I'm passively interested in a game, I do not spend sixty dollars on it at launch. But if I have a heavy interest in the game, like Flight Simulator 2020, I spend $130 on the ultimate bundle. I go all in because I don't buy $60 games once or twice a month. I just don't. It's it, $60 for a video game seems it's it's a lot, and I and I I'm too passively interested in a lot of stuff to justify spending sixty dollars two three four times a month on a video game. So if I'm passively interested, I put it on the wish list when it says, "Hey, uh, GTA Five is on sale for twenty dollars for two days only." Then yeah, maybe I'll download GTA Five. Hey, Rocket League is on sale for five dollars. Of course I'm going to download Rocket League if it's five dollars. Anytime it goes down from sixty to around twenty. And yeah, I'll, I'll I'll make a purchase if I'm in that if I'm that inclined. So if you are in that kind of boat where you're passively interested, for sure, put Flight Simulator 2020 in your on your wish list. And if it ever has a price reduction, go for it. If you're a hardcore aviation enthusiast, simulation enthusiast, buy it. Freaking buy it. It is so real. It is unreal. It is awesome. Now, on to the glitches and the downloads. I'll just say game glitches when you're actually playing the game. Yes, there are going to be glitches. There's going to be glitches in the game forever. They will just be addressed as they pop up. There are some graphical uh, issue, you know, glitches here and there. There's some glitches in the menu. I told, said yesterday that when you do get the game installed, when you first go into the menu, you don't see anything. You have to hit escape, and then all the menu items appear. Kind of little glitchy things, but you know they're going to be patching those routinely. Microsoft themselves have said this is at least a 10-year project. They they are predict, they, predicting. I don't know if they've actually committed to this, but they've said this type of thing is a 10-year project. They are not going to stop updating Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. Uh, for the next decade or so, it's that huge of a game, and there's that much of a community and support behind it. They are going to back their product for several years to come. So, is the game glitchy here and there? Yes, but it's nothing. I haven't found it to be anything major or or detracting. Hey, there's a, a tree that's laying over that road that's not supposed to be there, type of thing, or that tree looks wonky, or the texture on this building. <laughs> what I think the Washington Monument, somebody posted a picture that the Washington Monument was actually like a 112 story condo. <laughs> For some reason, it was applying the texture of, a, of an apartment building to the Washington Monument. So there's little glitchy things like that, but that stuff's always going to be addressed and fixed as you go on. The game itself is solid. Gameplay is solid. Now to the downloading glitches, the reason why people are giving it mixed reviews on Steam. The downloading glitches, I'm going to go through a list of possible fixes that I found. This is from coming from Windows Central. Any website you, you find that's mentioning the download glitches are going to tell you the same thing as of this point. We are two days into the release of Flight Simulator. It came out on the 18th as of recording right now. It is the 20th. Here are the recommended, I hesitate to call it fixes, because these are just things that they say, hey, try this. 
there is no fix right now because the fix, the fix is Microsoft fixing it. Also, it may not be just that Microsoft has to fix this. It's just that there's such a huge demand on it right now that we just will probably have to be patient for a few days until everyone gets this thing downloaded and there's just some relief on the, the system entirely. I kind of leaned 51% towards, more towards, Microsoft has to fix this. It's twofold. The problem is twofold. One, there's high demand. Two, Microsoft needs to fix the download issues. Part and parcel. All part of the same situation. But here are the things to try. And I'm looking at Windows Central. Restart Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'm going to read, read from this. Restart Microsoft Flight Simulator. When encountering issues with downloads within Microsoft Flight Simulator, one common solution requires a restart of the title. Closing and reopening the program may lose current download progress, but it can be a f quick fix to alleviate hangups and get back on track. Okay, so close it. Alt F4, close it, strangle it, and process whatever. Kill the program and then restart it. Have you tried turning it on and off again? That's what that fix is. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> it's a fix. It's just, it's not even a fix. It's just something to try. Leave Microsoft Flight Simulator full screen. So when you launch the launcher, make sure that you hit Alt Enter and it's in full screen mode. For some reason, it kind of helps some people downloading. It says when downloading in game content for Microsoft Flight Simulator, try spanning your game full screen and leaving the PC to handle the full installation. The issue previously impacted. This, the issue previously impacted our staff, sometimes resulting in crashes when left downloading new content in the background, minimized in the system tray. However, if progress isn't made within 10 minutes, we recommend pursuing further troubleshooting steps, aka turning it off and turning it on again. <laughs> Fixing slow downloads. This is what Anderson sent me on Twitter the other day. In the command prompt, go to the command prompt as an administrator and type... <laughs> NetSH space INT space TCP space set space global space auto tuning level equals normal and press enter. Okay, so I tried that. I tried that and it didn't help. It didn't hurt anything, but it didn't help. I should mention right now to remind you, I have Flight Simulator downloaded and running fine on my desktop PC at home, miraculously, but I'm having just the dickens of a time getting it to run or getting it to install on my laptop i've been trying since launch to get it to install on my laptop i've been trying to download it at work i've been trying to download it at home it always hangs on the download at various positions in the download it's a nightmare so trying that command prompt uh command didn't hurt anything but it didn't help anything two this the next thing third or fourth whatever this is change the installation path Microsoft Flight Simulator's Content Manager also features the ability to choose where you install your game content. If you have a secondary hard drive, attempt to change the installation repository. Alternatively, create a new folder on your existing hard drive and attempt a fresh installation in that location. Tried it, didn't work. Not for me, at least. The next thing it says is, is software in the way? While it's best practice to keep your PC running healthy, various Windows fe security features may hold your flight simulator experience back. Your antivirus, firewall, or user account limitations may restrict the download process. Temporarily turn off any potentially interfering processes one by one and see if your experience improves when a particular feature isn't in play. Tried it, doesn't work. Not for me at least. Stuck at 3.68 gigabytes, many users report no issues when installing the majority of Flight Simulator, but later encounter hurdles. Late, but later encounter hurdles when restarting the title. The title may open to a later 3.6 gigabyte update, which fails to download once started. A workaround remains unclear at this point in time. Well, you know what? In general, this is me commenting now. In general, a workaround is unclear for all of this. Reinstall Microsoft Flight Simulator. Yes, it's not ideal, but reinstalling the Microsoft Flight Simulator client could fix underlying download issues. While resetting your download progress to 0%, a clean install of the title may correct any undetected hiccups impacting your original installation. So delete everything and start over, basically. Turn it off and turn it on again. The, th the last one, and I think this is the most important one to remember, is, according to the website, 
just remember, it's launch day. While you may be eager to jump onto Microsoft Flight Simulator the moment it launches in your region, remember, you're not alone. The sheer number of new users looking to download game content is guaranteed to impact speeds in some areas, even despite Microsoft's best efforts. After the initial launch rush subsides, installing the game outside of peak hours could eliminate several variables hindering downloads today. We'll update this post over the hours ahead with new updates as they come. So, to recap, basically, basically, all advice as of right now, as of August 20th, two days after Flight Simulator 2020 launch, is just to fiddle with it, start it, stop it, close the program, restart it, try downloading it off, uh, off hours, you know, off peak hours. So, like, when are off peak hours? Really? When are off peak hours? I don't know. It varies by region, I guess. But it's kind of hard to tell it with in COVID coronavirus times. Do we have peak and off peak hours or it's all kind of pretty just much steady? A lot of people have insomnia now. They're on the Internet. But if you can figure out what the off peak hours are for your area and try it then. Basically, basically just fiddle with it until it downloads. <laughs> That's the advice from all over the Internet right now. Hey, try this. Try this. Try this. Turn it off again. Turn it on again. Turn it off again. Turn it on again. Close the launcher. Open the launcher. Close it. If it hangs, close it. Start. Restart it. Just keep trying, basically. So that's why my advice is just like windowscentral.com here, just remember that it's launch day, AKA it's a miracle that I was able to download it on my desktop, but it's no surprise that I can't download it on my laptop. I can't be lucky twice. It's just gonna take patience for a lot of us to actually be able to download the game and play it. I would be remiss if I didn't close out by bringing one possible issue this arises, this uh, this presents when you're downloading from Steam and possibly other sources, Windows Live or whatever. On Steam, most of the time when it comes to refunds, it entirely depends on how long you've spent playing the game. So. If you play the game for, I don't know what it is, just being arbitrary, 30 minutes, you decide you don't like it, you can get a refund. Delete it, you get a refund. The problem with Flight Simulator is, and using a launcher, is that when you launch Flight Simulator from Steam, it opens that download launcher. And that download launcher counts as gameplay time. So if you are downloading for 10 hours and it gets stuck, and you keep trying, and you've poured... You know, your Steam account reports that you've poured 100 hours into this game and all that 100 hours was is trying to download the freaking thing that can impact your ability to get a refund. Now, I'm sure that both Microsoft and Steam are aware of this issue. I haven't read anything official as of recording right now. I haven't looked for it, but I would assume that let's say you pour 50 hours into Flight Simulator and you can't get it to download and you want a refund. Surely Steam would honor that they would know about the issue and pres presumptively give you your money back or you'd have a strong argument because it's a known issue i can't, i'm not saying that steam will refund your money i'm just saying it's a known issue i'm sure they're aware of it but for you thinking about downloading microsoft flight simulator just be aware that the launcher in the actual download process counts towards your gameplay hours as far as Steam is concerned. That's going to be a nightmare for Steam to <laughs> for, team, for Steam to address here in the next few days, I'm sure. But just be aware of that. So I think that about does it for this episode of Geek Therapy Radio. I hope it was helpful to some. How am I going to label this? Tips to help with the installs? Current state of Flight Simulator install? I don't I don't know. We'll see. Friend wraps Camaro around tree. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is I'll timestamp it accordingly. Uh, thank you so much for listening. You are worthy of love. You're worthy of giving love. You're worthy of receiving love. And you're worthy of your own self-respect and self-confidence. Please embrace your geek thing. Let it fill you with confidence and with pride in what you are capable of doing. Especially if you think you're not capable of anything. Find a hobby. Embrace a hobby. Maybe you got out of an old hobby. Embrace it again. We're all geeks about something. Embrace your inner geek. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll talk to you 
Oh, it's Thursday now. Hmm, I talk to you tomorrow or the podcast is probably going to come out on Sunday night. Have a great weekend if I don't talk to you before then. Take care. <laughs> 